New York is a state divided. Six women, six stories, six unique voices in search of what can save New York. My name is Uni Blake. I am an environmental scientist and I live in the town of Maryland, which, in, which is upstate New York in Otsego County. My name is Marion Shereko and I'm a small business owner. I own Marion's Pizza Shack. I've been in business for 20 years. I'm Sue Mickley. I'm a farmer, a housewife, and a writer. I'm Inge Grafikiklag. I live in Sullivan County. My profession is I'm a kindergarten teacher. Chris Lacey, and I am a um, housewife and grandmother, and I live in the town of Shenango in the Binghamton, New York area. Hazel Brand. I was the first woman police officer in Broome County in 1975. I was on the police part-time for 12 years. I was the town of Windsor tax collector for 16 years, and I drove school bus for 27 years. And I'm from Windsor, New York. Natural gas is the last best hope we have to turn our economy around. There is nothing waiting in line behind natural gas to come make us prosperous again. I think this is our only shot. Our story in upstate New York is way too familiar. Your children grow up and they move away. And both of our daughters had to move out of state in order to get good jobs. Both of them would love to move back to the Binghamton area to raise their families. Our one daughter, our younger daughter, who's an electrical engineer, decided four years ago to follow her dream and she packed up her family, her kids, her pets, everything, put her house in California on the market, and moved across country to move back to Binghamton and look for a job. Electrical engineer, we thought she'd be able to get a job. So they lived with us for six months, and she didn't have a single offer of anything. And after six months, she realized they couldn't afford to stay here anymore. So they had to pack everything up, the moving trucks came, hauled all of their stuff, the kids, the horses, the dogs, all went back to the West Coast where she had her choice of jobs. I think the saddest part is she realized she was never going to have that dream. Her dream died of being able to move back to her hometown. Upstate New York is beautiful. The people are very nice and kind and warm and friendly. We have to ask ourselves, you know, what can we do that can benefit all of us as a community. Some of the things that people raise is, all oh, gas development will come and they will bring their own jobs and we won't be able to work. And my question was always, why? Why can't we get those jobs? Why? And, well, we're not trained. Then why can't we set up training for those jobs so that we can get ready for those jobs. Oh, gas development will come and they will take over our schools and we won't be able to have a say in it. Why won't we have a say? You know, I just don't understand why we just kind of stopped um, the discussion at that point and left it over there instead of trying to answer all those questions. I came to America from Kenya and Kenya is a little bit different from the way it is up here in New York. The environmental regulations in Kenya are very, very lax. And as a child, I saw this. I remember when I was real little, driving through a small town in Western Kenya, peering out my window and seeing the smokestacks and smelling the fumes coming from the paper mill. And even as a little child, I knew there was something really, really wrong with that. And that is probably where my journey began. When I started college, I decided I wanted to be the kind of person that makes a difference. I wanted to change the world. I wanted to be able to go back to those countries and say, look, there's something wrong with this and it needs to change. And it's not like when you say you want to change it, you don't want to take it away from the people. Because this particular paper mill is, is, gives at least 4,000 people jobs. And if you take it away from them, they don't have a job. And so what you have to do is try and work with the community and work with the companies and work with the regulations and try and make everything balance out. It's all about risk and benefit. I see prosperity coming as a result of gas drilling in any community. There's, I don't think there's a place in the United States and possibly not anywhere in the world where it hasn't had a positive impact like this on the economy of the area where it's being done. Again, you're bringing in workers, you're bringing in high-end jobs, not 
you know, wage limit jobs. You're, you're bringing in economic stimulators that are they're absolutely fantastic for all aspects of the community. I just talked to, to several farmers. The one is just, I mean, just barely hanging on. He, he might have to declare bankruptcy. The other farmer told me a couple of weeks ago that he has to take money out of his savings because just to, to go on. You cannot run a business like this to just survive. You have to make some profit. And if they would have gas leases, they could go on. Everybody talks about open space. If they have to sell, houses will be built on. And a house is a permanent thing. A gas drilling rig is a five-week thing, and then it goes away. That's not a mortar and, and brick building. Back in the 60s, uh, when my children were younger, uh, there was a lot of dairy farms around, some very big ones, some small farmers, and there was a lot of businesses on Main Street, and I've lived in Windsor for 48 years. I love New York. I love my business. I love running my business in New York. I just wish I had more business for my business. The division in this debate is that the people that come from maybe New York or New Jersey, they come here, they want a status quo. They do not think about the people that live there and have to make a living. They're just there to enjoy their life, their, the surroundings, and they see it only positive. The other people don't come into the equation, so that's just, for them, they don't exist. This fight over gas drilling has, has been blown out of all proportion, mostly by people who don't live here. And I think that the media and the Hollywood types and the New York City people have turned it into something nasty and uncivilized. My husband and I were married for 57 years, and he was worked for 45 years out of Operating Engineers Local 825 out of Newark, New Jersey. But before he worked in construction, at 17 years old, he left school to go into service. He was in the Navy. He served in the Philippines. He talked about Subic Bay. He used to talk about Zigzag Pass. Uh, and then he came back from World War II went back to school and did two years in one and graduated. When Bob was working on the Cannonsville Dam, we lived in a trailer with four children. It wasn't easy. Then we were able to get the farm that we have uh, through Bob's GI Bill. So we had animals, we had cows and sheep and pigs, you name it, we had it. We have this lovely property that perfect paradise for children. Our grandchildren can't wait to come stay with grandma and grandpa for a vacation. We would love to pass that on to the next generation, but who can afford to live here? Natural gas that is extremely affordable and extremely efficient and extremely effective. And that is where we need to put our focus is and how can we use natural gas to somehow energize our communities? How can how can we use it to keep our youth home? A lot of people ask me, you know, what's, if I have a horse in the race, I guess that's the way a lot of people put it. I'm a mother and I have five children. And I have five children that live over the shale. And if development was to occur, it became personal, you know. Um, it's different when you're over there talking about something else, but when it comes into your family, you take a very, very strong interest in it. We have this one shot and we're not being allowed to take it. Why the people are in Sullivan County quiet, it's very easily described. A lot of business people are afraid. I just heard a couple of weeks ago that one businesswoman in Jeffersonville wanted, had a sign, I, I uh, support gas drilling. The signs, those lawn signs in her window and people came into her store and told her, 
If you're not taking it out, you go on a plaque list. The people are afraid to talk up. The, the, the other side is almost like militant, like mafia methods. If I would have the truth on my side and the facts on my side, I don't have to use these methods. You don't hear from people because when we voice our opinions, we will go frequently to forums or to hearings, and you have to stand up in front of a crowd of several hundred people, and you're given two minutes or three minutes to voice your opinion. And almost every time one of us who is for safe drilling stands up in front of this crowd, we are called names, we are booed, we are shouted down, and amazingly, the people running these hearings don't do anything. The, one of the hearings we were at, every single person ahead of me was being booed and jeered and called names. And finally, then they were doing it to me. And I said something to the moderator after I was done, saying, you're not solving this problem. Um, they, they, they are nasty. They are intimidating. And, and as I said to you once, I, I think that to sum up how I feel about the antis is that I'm afraid to put a pro-gas drilling bumper sticker on my car. I'm afraid my car will be vandalized or that I would actually be accosted. These people act in a threatening manner. I feel threatened, and I think that's sad. One of the uh, gas meetings that my husband and I attended over at the Forum in Bingleton, New York, when my husband and I came out, a gentleman was outside and wanted to know if I would like to sign a petition about gas, and I said, yes, I would. And this man came up and stuck his face right in my face and said, don't you dare sign that. And I forgot I wasn't on the police anymore, and I grabbed his arm, and I put my hand back in his face, and I said, he wasn't talking to you, he was talking to me. And the man left, and my husband said, why did you do that? And I said, because he was wrong and I was right. A lot of people don't want to get involved because they figure they, their neighbor might not agree with them, and it might cause friendships or something like that. But I think of the profit that would come from this, I think it's worth letting your neighbor be mad at you. My oldest son has gone off to college. He's going to get a degree in engineering. I look around our town, I look around our region, and I don't see a job for him. I, I see no form of employment for him. And so I know he's going somewhere else. I know he's going to be moving down to Florida or North Carolina or somewhere else. And it's something we really have to think about. When we look at the numbers, like the statistics in Otsego County, and we see that the age group of college graduates that actually return to the area is, is getting less and less and less, our communities are losing the vitality. We're investing in our schools, we're paying taxes at our schools, and these children are not investing back in the community, they're leaving. So we're investing in other states to succeed. So we have to take a look at this. We have to start really talking about jobs, and not just any jobs. We have to talk about good paying jobs that can keep this, um, this, this age group home, you know, close to their families. I have four children that are going to come after him when he graduates and moves away, and I want them to stay in the area. I want them to, to love this area as much as I love it, and I want this to become their home as well. So when we're talking about how difficult it was when our daughter and grandchildren had to leave and go back to California, um, I, I think that as far as our daughter is concerned and we're concerned, we accepted that that because she'd lived in California for so long. The really hard part was the children, our grandchildren. Our grandchildren, she has three children, they grew up in California for the most part, and we would see them once a year. And then for six months, they lived with us, and we saw them every day, and we read to them at night, and they were there for breakfast, and we got them on sports teams. We did all this. They were a part of our family. We really got to know them, and, and in a way we never could when they lived on the other side of the country. And so when they left, it wasn't just her dream that died. It was our dream of really having a relationship with our grandchildren. And packing off their stuff was sad, but seeing them drive out the driveway was heartbreaking. There's no jobs. We have job fairs. There's no jobs. If we don't do this, I, I can't imagine what the future's going to be. Drilling for gas is not going to hurt the environment. It's not going to 
change that green grass out there. The grass is still going to be green. It's not like you're coming in and you're tearing everything up and, and you're left with this uh, war zone. It's not that at all. It's not that at all. One of the things I did in my study was to look at areas that weren't, didn't have gastrolling impact to kind of give a perspective during this terrible economy. Because in the areas where gastrolling is happening, unemployment's pretty low. So I said, if we, if we looked at areas that didn't have gas drilling, then what's been the impact over that 10 years on those communities? One of the areas I went to was Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And it's terrible down there. And, and if you kind of understand the community, they have some of the best, best healthcare institutions in the world, but they also have some of the highest poverty factors in the world. Vacant buildings, which brings in gangs and drugs, which brings in the dereliction of our, of our children where they don't have a future. And it, it tears the family structure apart. It tears the community structure apart. Poverty is rampant down there. When you look in the rural communities, it's a, a, a small composite of that happens again, where the buildings fall apart and you get this, this direct image in your face of buildings falling apart, but it also means that the family structure is falling apart and the health of the children is falling apart and the education of the children is falling apart. You get the same dichotomy between the big city areas that are in trouble and these small communities. Same thing's happening. The impact that this can have on rural poverty, that predominantly the gas drilling is going to occur in our countrysides. And most people see the pristine images that they see from highways. Very rarely do they see what's going on in these communities. When you make the effort to look around, when you make the effort to drive through some of these small towns and see how they're struggling, see how the boarded up stores, to see the, the roofs that are leaking and they have blue tarps hanging on the roofs because they can't afford to get a new one. When you see that this is prevalent amongst the communities that right now are being put on hold, it, it just breaks your heart because you know that there's something that can fix it. But because of this crazy misrepresentation of the impact of it, these, all these people have to wait and, and be in fear that it's never gonna happen for them. They're never gonna get better. So when you get to rural poverty issues and you're looking at the real heartbreaker of children and the impact on children, you've gotta understand that, that how a child's health is managed influences the rest of their life. If it's poorly managed, then they are going to have to live with the consequences. And it's not their fault, they're children. The biggest difference from our side and the anti side is, in my opinion, the other side sees only one direction, negative. Nothing ever comes out that is positive about gas drain, like uh, what it would do for the county, what it would do for the little towns that, with the ad valorem tax. The idea that natural gas drilling is going to destroy places like this is just not correct. The science is not there that that's going to happen. When, when I moved here 35 years ago from the Midwest to the southern tier, Binghamton was booming. It was the place to be. And I just think that it's really ironic and sad that now upstate New York is stagnating and states in the Midwest like North Dakota are booming and it's all because of shale energy. Now in North Dakota, unemployment's 3% and people are flooding into North Dakota for shale energy jobs. And all those people need to have houses, transportation, food, doctors, lawyers, teachers, that's a boom. And New York State doesn't want a piece of that? New Yorkers have tended to treat the Midwest like some kind of joke, but in North Dakota, they're laughing all the way to the bank. I think people don't get involved because they don't want to be in the middle. But I, I'm for it, and I'm not afraid to stand up for it, and I will stand up for it until it happens. When you testify in front of the EPA or uh, DEC or whatever, I testified in front of several agencies, you get booed. There's always loud. They always giggle. There, there is nothing that they accept. You can talk, uh, you can bring up facts all the time, but 
for them, it's not what they want to hear. They are not thinking clearly anymore. They are, their reasoning is impaired because they are, this whole movement is, is based on psychological warfare and based on fear. If you tell everybody your water is uh, contaminated, uh, the people are dying, the people are becoming fearful. And that's how you keep them in line. You don't even have a discussion possible anymore because there is nothing positive or possible to discuss when you're fearful. You are, I heard from a, a guy in Morocco just a couple of months ago, he said one sentence, fear is a prison. And they are in prison with their fears. At one time we had IBM, we had uh, Endicott Johnson, uh, Main Street Windsor had, oh, probably 10 stores around there, give or take. There was work for people so you could raise a family. You can't do that here today. You really can't. You have a choice between going into more poverty or prospering. That's your choice. I personally choose to prosper. When I got involved in this discussion, I spent a lot of time talking to people. I actually spent a lot of time in people's living rooms because I really wanted to understand what their concerns were. And I really wanted to know what their perception of gas development was. And I talked to a lot of farmers. Uh, the town of Maryland is, was basically a farming community. But a lot of the farms have shut down. A lot of the um, children have left, as we all know. And my question to a lot of the farmers was, what do you see as your benefit in this? For example, I have one young man that lives in our town, and his pet project or pet hobby is building solar panels. And he said to me that if he was able to get some money somehow out of gas development, he wanted to build a company making solar panels. You know, people don't know these about the farmers, you know. Another farmer I talked to was talking about expanding their herd and um, they are not been able to do that. In fact, he had to sell off a lot of his cows just to you know, to survive this economic downturn. Instead of exporting people out of New York, we can export gas out of New York and import people for all the jobs that are going to be created and import money. We export gas, not people. The big thing about being part of a group, especially if you're a woman, is that you draw power from each other and you can bounce ideas off each other and you feel like you have somebody else in the fight with you. And I think it's really important to hear our voices. Our voices are not being heard. Um, and so we've tried to get together as a group and try to find new ideas, new techniques to get the, the pro-safe drilling message out there. And so what you have to do is try and work with the community and work with the companies and work with the regulations and try and make everything balance out. It's all about risk and benefit. And it's very green. The solution is gas drilling, bringing in more income to a community, letting a community thrive. By the grace of God, there is natural gas under us. It's there. It's waiting for us to say, okay, let's do something about it. And we can. And when we do that, we can have the jobs. We can have the homes, the families can stay here. It can prosper. It's the only country in the world that where you have the mineral rights under your, under your uh, crown or on your property. And I think we have to keep this right and we have to defend it and we have to fight for it. And we can never, ever let anybody take it away from us. We need to stop the moratorium on gas drilling and start drilling for shale energy now. Bob turned 84 on January 8th and he passed away the next day. But he would want me to carry on and that's what I'm trying to do to promote gas drilling in New York State. And I hope the governor sees it our way and it happens soon. It is time to say drill baby drill.